Hey everyone, uh, my name is Emily and this week I was a part of the ICE discharge team. So we were looking at ways to combine ice sat data, some velocity data and bedrock topography data in order to calculate grounded ice flux and grounding line migration of Antarctic glaciers. Lawrence, could we go to the next? So our motivation for this project, um, as we're all very well aware, climate change is real and sea level rise is one of the most important consequences of this. So we therefore wanted to use ISAT2 data as a tool to track, uh, to track contributions to the sea level rise from key Antarctic glaciers. Um, our overall goal this week was to develop, to develop a workflow um, to generate a high level estimate of this ice discharge over grounding lines over time. And we also wanted to try and make this workflow portable, meaning that it could be applied easily to any Antarctic glacier just given a shape file. Um, so I'll pass it over to Lizzie to talk about our methods. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, okay, cool. Um, so our methods, we, we familiarized ourselves with a sample basin. In this case, we chose Totten Glacier in Antarctica. Um, then we ingested and processed um, some data sets that would be bed topography from measures bed machine. We did the annual ice velocity from the its life surface velocity, ice thickness, and we chose ATL 14 and ATL 15. And then we used the basins and grounding lines from the measures bounding, uh, boundaries and grounding. All of our general data, we cropped it to the area that we were interested in, um, calculated the ice thickness, and um, extracted the information along that grounding line. And then from there, we were able to calculate ice flux. Yeah, so uh, in order to think about where we'd like to place our flux gate to calculate the ice charge uh, discharge, we first wanted to look um, for a suitable location. So Totten Glacier has the largest ice discharge in East Antarctica with an ice flux of around 71 gigatons per year, which was calculated between 2003 and 2008. Um, and this fast flow piqued our interest um, and we decided to have a more in-depth look at Totten's grounding line. So uh, utilizing some of the methods that we learned over the course of this week, we analyzed along track products, ATL03, ATL06 and ATL08, um, from ice at two to see the elevation changes from the grounded ice to the ice shelf. Um, so on the left-hand side, we have the Landsat 8 image from late December of 2018, showing the transition of smooth surface to fast flowing crevassed ice. Um, and then on the right, we show land ice surface um, elevation from around the same time period with the sloping elevation indicating grounding ice, grounded ice, and then the plateaued squiggly lines um, representing the rough ice shelf surface. Uh, so ideally, ice flux gates would be located landward of the grounding line, um, just to account for potential grounding line uh, retreat. But with the time constraints of this week, we decided that the grounding line was a suitable location to compute ice discharge. So um, to start our experiment, um, because we are dealing with multiple large data sets, um, so before doing any calculation, we decided to clip the raster data to the uh, drainage basin, which is Tartan Glacier in this case. Uh, so what we did is to uh, get the basin boundary from an SIDC and uh, extract Tartan Basin from it, and then use that as a mask to uh, use that to mask the raster products we have. So on the right of the screen is the uh, our two example maps of the ATL 14 and 15 products we're using. Um, so ATL 14 uh, offers the uh, annual graded land ice elevation uh, at 100 meter resolution. And the ATL 15 uh, that is derived from ATL 6 gives is also like graded product, but it provides the elevation change every three months. Um, and mm, we're using the one kilometer resolution product. So with that, I'll hand it to Brian. Yeah, yeah so um, once we had the reference DEM, which is the ATL 14 product, and that's like the DEM from cycle six, so 2020, um, we then 
calculated um, seasonal DEMs by adding the um, height difference from the ATL15 product um, from each cycle, which you can see um, going through in the cycle and the animation here. Um, and yeah, that created uh, DEMs for each um, cycle. So we had 12 in, in total. Um, the, interestingly, looking at the um, difference maps, you can in the um, in the D, yeah, the seasonal DHDT, you can see this little um, region, which I think is a signal of a lake, um, a subglacial lake filling, which was quite cool to see as well in this data set. Um, and so once we had the seasonal DEMs, you go to the next slide, please. Um, we then subtracted the bed elevation from bed machine from each of those seasonal DEMs to calculate uh, rasters of seasonal ice thickness. And um, so each so each of the 12 cycles, we have a raster of ice thickness, um, which we could then feed into our ice discharge calculations. And then if we go on to the next slide. So as well as ice thickness, we need to know about the speed of the ice. Um, and so for with the time constraints of the pro project, um, we just decided to use the annual, the 2018 surface velocity mosaic from its live. Um, it would have been great to use later um, years, but the 2019 to 21 data sets are actually due to be published in the next few weeks, it said. So we're stuck with the 2018 one for now. But we also then crop that to the basin extent to feed into our, um, into our discharge calculations. So I'll pass over to Lawrence. Cool. Yeah. So um, all of the cropping um, is really so that we can look at kind of basin wide changes. We can look at um, elevation changes and thickness changes over time over the entire basin. But what we were really interested here is um, how that ice moves across the grounding line. So we really were interested in what happens at that grounding line um, transect. So what I'm showing here is just uh, the transect values along the grounding line for ice thickness and ice velocity. And so using the NSIDC, like the measures mapped grounding line locations, we overlaid that with the, the rasters and we extracted the value uh, along, along the grounding line. So this just shows a transect. Um, and you can see sort of the range in ice thickness from, you know, sort of 100 to 200 meters uh, all the way up to 2,500 meters. And that's simply due to the shape of the grounding line. It's awesome. It's sort of really, it's really deep. Um, and then this zoomed in plot up the top just shows the difference between those ice thicknesses. So you can see that there's uh, sort of almost two meters of, of difference between those ice at two cycles. And then this bottom plot shows the ice, ice velocity again along that grounding line um, location, location. So these are just transects taken out of the, of the gridded products. And then using this information, we're able to um, get an estimate of the ice discharge across the grounding line. Um, I think Mark is going to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so this is um, this is our ice discharge that we found for Totten. It is a rather um, unflashy product, but the main thing we are doing is we're looking at similar to calculating like a Riemann sum across that whole flux gate that Lawrence was talking about. We'll take the height difference at any given point, the velocity and um, the length of the individual line segment that we made um, to calculate our total flux across our grounding line, which is our gate, and then adjusted it into gigatons water equivalents, which we have plotted here over time. Um, you will see that we had um, a couple little issues, mainly in that we only used one velocity plot. Um, so according to the literature, many of these big outlet glaciers are accelerating while they thin, and we don't have that resolution inside of here. So you'll see Totten is um, discharging less and less, but it may be more and more. We're not 100%. There's also issues on some resolution. Um, and, uh, and you will know from the beginning, um, Julia had pointed out that we were looking to expect about 71 gigatons of discharge off of this, whereas we have about 171. Um, so this may be um, issues with where our grounding line was placed, or our flux gate was placed at the grounding line, resulting in uh, faster flows along these cross sections um, or the grounding line migration. So we may have a few issues in there to tune up. Um, but I'll talk about a couple more challenges first. Lawrence, you give us the next slide. Uh, the little mountains we had to climb here was um, 
getting to work together across different time zones. Our whole group was spread out over the United States, but also England and Australia. Um, we had a few love-hate relationships with GitHub, one of which was my fault. And um, it's, it's a wonderful tool, but sometimes it takes a little getting used to. As I mentioned, we have spatial and temporal um, concerns such as ATL 15, as we mentioned, is, um, is at an entire kilometer of resolution. So we're really losing a lot of detail there and our time records for velocity. Our group had a variety of different skill levels and assigning out tasks uh, inside of the week of time constraint was a lot of fun, but I'm glad we did get to work out a pretty good uh, solid outline of a product despite running into the mysterious man every once in a while figured out at the last moment. We did have one great success though. Our main goal was to create a workflow that we could apply to catchments all over Antarctica. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Lawrence. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, we wanted to show that everything we talked about here is focused on Totten, um, but we wanted to show that we have applied it to um, another basin. So I'm just going to jump into our notebook here. Um, and so right up front, based on the ice boundaries, uh, there's a whole long list of different ice um, sort of boundaries and basins that are already mapped within Antarctica. And so here we're going to sort of run this for, for Thwaites. I have run it, it does take a little while, so I just um, have rerun things, but we'll just walk through some of the outputs. So essentially you could select anything from this list, punch it in here, um, and then cross your fingers and hope that the, that the output is generated. So we can see here, we're just isolating Thwaites from the, uh, from the sort of spatial uh, polygons. And so here we're able to plot the bed topography for Thwaites. So the grounding line is, is over here. Um, and then we continue down. This is the grounding line shape. So this is that transect. This is essentially our flux gate. So this is the line uh, for which we're pulling values across. Here, we're just showing the ice velocity. So these are all of those spatial masks and clips that we do just to be able to plot and calculate basin-wide statistics. Uh, and then if we continue down, here we have the seasonal change in um, ice surface. So this is plotted for each of the current 12 uh, cycles. So that's cool, they're relative to this cycle here. So the change is, the change is zero and everything is relative to the ATL 14, which is um, at this corresponding time. Uh, we keep going, these are the, um, the seasonal surface elevation. So the DEMs for each of the ISAT2 cycles. So we can just throw those out and then the subsequent ice thickness as Brian was saying. Uh, and then this is what we, what we subsequently use in our calculation. So now we just extract those values along the flux gate. Um, and for now we're using the, using the grounding line that could, be, that could be elsewhere. So these are those transect plots for Thwaites uh, Basin. So this is the ice thickness along the grounding line and the ice velocity. And again, if I, if I zoom in, oops, it's not gonna play. Okay, if you zoom in, you can see that there, that there is a change. Um, and then once we throw all of that together, we can calculate um, an ice flux again across that grounding line, but for a different basin. So yay, proof of concept that we can take it from Totten where we sort of developed everything and apply it somewhere else. Um, the idea then would be that we could um, apply this to a whole bunch of different, different basins, uh, determine sort of relative contributions from various basins around Antarctica. Again, as um, Mark mentioned, like we're, we're significantly overestimating ice discharge, uh, but I'm just gonna jump back to the slides here for some next steps, and I can talk a little bit more about that. So first things first, we would like to take a, take a little, little time to go back through the code. Uh, we've been aggregating that sort of master workflow from um, pieces of the puzzle that the team members have been developing. And so, there's for sure some bugs in there. It's not, not the prettiest, um, but it's the general workflow is working. So I'd like to revisit that and tidy that up. Um, once the additional it's live velocity data sets are published, we'd like to explore kind of using those so that we're using 2019 velocities for the 20, um, 2019 elevations so that we're getting a, a, a sort of better, a better estimate as we go through time. Uh, we also thought that we could explore using the ATL06 along track velocities for given um, perhaps given basins of interests where the tracks align nicely with the, with the ice flow. So we might be able to get some better ice velocity 
estimates using a, 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 another ISAP product. Um, and then I think the big one is, I think a lot of the overestimate is due to the fact that we're, we're using the surface elevation throughout the entire ice thickness. So exploring some ways to account for the sort of stresses and basal drag that, um, that, that occur so that we can get a better estimate of the actual flux rather than assuming that it's just the, the, the ice surface velocity. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where we're at. Um, it's, it's working, it needs a little bit of love, but the proof of concept is there, which is um, kind of what we were hoping to achieve this week. And uh, again, I think we would all extend our thanks to all of the organizers. We've all learned a ton um, and it's been a blast.